Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, plans the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. From 1 John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God. We confess that we are obliged to sin, and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, forgive us, forgive us.
You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living creature. We praise you for crowning the fields with your blessings, enabling us once more to gather the fruits of the earth. Teach us to use your gifts carefully, that the land may continue to yield her in To your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, 
for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, He scatters abroad and gives to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, who will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will collect out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. On this Harvest Home Sunday, 2023, the word comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The cheerful giver, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This lesson that we have from 2 Corinthians this morning brings back some memories for me. Twenty plus years ago, my wife and I belonged to a church that used this passage seemingly every year around this time not for Harvest Home Sunday, but for Stewardship Sunday. God loves a cheerful giver, we heard in the weeks leading up to Stewardship Sunday, again and again and again. Then, on the big Stewardship Sunday, we heard a sermon on the obligations to be cheerful givers. Now, a lot of you know me pretty well now, I can be kind of a cranky guy. So I wasn't always cheerful at my giving at this church. I can be cranky. So after the sermon, during this service, Stewardship Sunday is this big deal. So after the sermon, um, 
But still during the service, we're all invited then to go down into the church basement where all the tables were kind of lined up and, and they were tablecloths and we sat down there and there were cards in front of us. And we were urged to consider how much we were going to give to the church in the year ahead. We were supposed to talk among each other, amongst ourselves. My wife and I are, are, can be introverts in that situation. We were a little uncomfortable. And then the moment of truth came. And we were all instructed to fill out our cards with a number about how much we were going to give that year. And remember, by the way, God loves a cheerful giver. At this point, when we're filling out the card, I remember looking over at my wife, and we were anything but cheerful givers in that moment. We were more annoyed givers. We were then instructed to fill out our cards and then take the cards back up into the sanctuary where the service then would continue, and we would lay our cards at the foot of the altar. It's strange in retrospect in thinking about that, because that church never had any kind of liturgy or ritual. But man, on Stewardship, Stewardship Sunday, we were parading around all over the church. It was a big deal. So I share this story with all of you to illustrate how this whole joyful giver thing can just be turned easily onto its head and, and turned right back under the law. And you know what? That's fine. If you belong to some sort of social club or some sort of organization, whatever, that's all fine. There is an obligation to keep things going right. But this is the church of Jesus Christ. We're gospel people. So let's get into this letter that we have, very briefly, from St. Paul as he writes to the church in Corinth in order to help us understand what being a cheerful giver is all about. Now, the context for this passage in 2 Corinthians is Paul is encouraging the young church in Corinth to give to its sister churches in Jerusalem. That's kind of the, the main center of things. And they are to give to the church in Jerusalem in order to support the poor and to encourage and to provide resources for the preaching of the gospel there in and around Jerusalem. After all, as St. Paul will write to the church in Corinth, we are all one body in Christ. The head of the church, as he would write to the Ephesians, is of course Jesus. Jesus who gave himself up for the church. The Pope didn't do that. Certainly no bishops have done that. No, it's Jesus who's the head of the church. Because here's the thing. This is a downward action of God for our salvation. It's not two arrows. It's not God coming down to us and then us meeting the arrow and going up. It's not God giving us mostly, most of the stuff and us finishing it off. No. This is a downward action of God for our salvation. This is the ultimate giving. You know, when you give a gift, there's no strings attached. It's just handed over. So St. Paul writes early in 2 Corinthians, for our sake, for all of us in the church, for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus becomes sin for us. This is a true picture of giving and love. God in the flesh for us. God in the flesh taking our sins. St. John will echo this in perhaps the most well-known biblical passages in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God came to us in the flesh in order to take the sins of the world into his flesh. And that world, that's just not some nebulous thing. That's you. That's me. Jesus takes your sins. They're nailed into his flesh as Peter will write. They were pressed down upon his forehead. They pierced his side. The five wounds of Jesus. This is God giving to us. 
Now what does God give to you in a most general way? Well, of course, it's first article of the creed stuff. Daily bread, life, friends, family, spouse, home, all of that and more. All that you have is given to you by God. But there's the thing. God doesn't just stop at that. God doesn't just stop with full bellies. Instead, God continues to give and give and give. In Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one, God gives to you His righteousness, His holiness, His justification, His absolution, His forgiveness. Daily, God gives this to us. Again and again. It's too good to be true. This is why we sing Amazing Grace. Maybe for, maybe for other people we might say. It's, it's just too good to be true. Maybe all of this stuff that God gives to us. Most of all, salvation. Maybe that's for other people, but, but my sins are too many, we might say. I am beyond the scope of God's giving of salvation. I'm that bad off. Maybe you say that. And the answer is no, sir. No, ma'am. You are not beyond that. All of this is yours. And all of that grace and mercy and love of God was poured over you in your baptism. Is anyone in Christ? St. Paul will write. He writes that to you. He writes that to the church in Corinth 2,000 years ago. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. And all of this is from God. And when Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself. This is the cheerful giving of God in Jesus Christ. It's yours this morning. That's why you're here. You are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. You're free in Him. The law, we say, until Christ. Now in Christ, you are free to be God's man and God's woman. Martin Luther used a term for this. It's a Latin term to describe what happens next to the forgiven and free Christian. The word is this, hilaritas. Over the last six months, I've given you a lot of Latin words. I, I don't know why that is. I'm trying to improve your party skills. Okay, So when you're out, talk to your friends. I'm going to talk about hilaritas. And people are like, wow, you're studying your Latin. That's really good. So I learned that term this week. And I got so excited about this, this word hilaritas. And I'll tell you what it means in a moment. I got so excited about this. Um, because it describes what a Christian heart is like, um, that I couldn't wait. I read it about it in a book, and I couldn't wait. 6 a.m., I'm texting my friend, who I think cares about this stuff sometimes. It's 6 a.m., and he's picking up his phone like, what is wrong with Goodman? Hilaritas. What, what, what do you care about that? That's okay. He knows me. Hilaritas, the root word in the English, it's the root word in the English for hilarity, Right? It means cheerfulness, joyfulness, spontaneity. We who have been given new birth in Jesus Christ, after having been freed from the bondage of sin and death, we enjoy a hilaritas of faith, a joyfulness, a spontaneity of faith, a free and merry heart, as our Lutheran confessions describe it. That's us. This is the cheerful giver of St. Paul's letter. It's not coerced. It's not transactional. It's not giving under the rules of the law or some sort of obligation to pay this or that. But rather we give as Christians for the aid of the poor and for the furthering of God's kingdom through the preaching of the gospel because we desire that. Our hearts are aligned with Christ. We want what Christ wants. We want others to hear the sweet gospel of Jesus. We want them to know what it is to have hilaritas in your heart, to be, have a free and merry heart in Jesus. We want others to have that too. 
Now, does that mean that we're always whistling zippity doo dah in church and have some sort of smile pasted on our faces? No. What it does mean, however, is that our hearts have been set free in Christ. Free from sin. Free from the fear of death. Free from what anything the world can bring at us. We're now alive in Him. And we want to be aligned with what Jesus wants in this world. Properly then, having this been given to us, having a new life in Christ, properly then, the last words that we say together when we gather together on Sunday, Thursday, whenever, we always say the same words. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gifts. For His gift of salvation that has absolved us of all of our sins and has cast aside our greatest fear, death. No longer claims you. No longer claims me. God in Jesus Christ is the cheerful giver. And joined to Him by faith, as you can see here at this table, we are as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ooh.